Oh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Fan, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Law Institute. Welcome to the International Law Institute. We're proud to host this talk on security at the Olympics from Munich to Sochi with Dr. Yona Alexander and the Inter-University Center for Legal Studies. Established in 1955, the International Law Institute is an independent, nonprofit training and technical assistance institute that helps developing countries in the mission of fostering prosperity through the rule of law, meaning helping countries achieve economic growth by having a good legal infrastructure. ILI has assisted countries in drafting their laws and has trained more than 28,000 government officials and practitioners from more than 185 countries on all matters from governance, anti-corruption, and how to participate in the global economy. The partnership with the Inter-University Center for Terrorism is due to our belief that development, economic growth, and the rule of law has the best chance of success when there is security, and conversely, that security is made stronger when rule of law is in place. Development and security needs to go hand in hand. This talk on security in the Olympics is very timely. We'd all like to think that the Olympics is about sports and international competition, but this Olympic has been weighed by security concerns and is a reminder that geopolitical politics and terrorism does not put itself on hold just because the Olympic flame is burning. And that while sports is for two weeks put on the world stage, so too does it make it exponentially more attractive for extreme and terrorist groups to try to get their agenda on the world stage. And with that, I would like to welcome the distinguished speakers, C-SPAN, and the audience to the International Law Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kim for your uh, welcome remarks. Um, our colleague, uh, Professor Don Wallace, uh, is uh, teaching now at Georgetown, and he couldn't uh, join us. But um, I'm very, uh, very proud that uh, we have the relationships for uh, basically uh, over uh, 30 years. And um, I, I want to mention particularly the uh, Inter-University Center for Legal Studies in, uh, in memory uh, of uh, our colleague, Professor Edgar Brenner, who unfortunately uh, died a few years ago. But uh, the center that we have uh, continues uh, with the work that uh, both of us try to develop for the past uh, 30 years, uh, dealing also with law schools um, and developing uh, legal uh, studies. I'm very uh, pleased that Mrs. Uh, John Brenner right here, his wife, who is uh, trying to follow uh, the work that uh, we are doing. So welcome. And um, I have to mention, obviously, some of the other co-sponsors um, of this particular event, in addition to the International Law Institute. I want to mention the Potomac. Uh, Institute for Policy Studies. Many of you are familiar with that because we uh, have basically every month at least uh, one, one event at uh, the Arlington uh, Center there. And um, we have, of course, a number of people from the uh, Potomac Institute who are right here. Unfortunately, again, some of our um, leaders uh, like Mike uh, Swetnam uh, is, uh, is away in General Gray, but at any rate, we, we have a few people I'd like to introduce before we continue. One is Lydia right here, who's Director of Communications, and she makes sure that we do have a record <coughs> of uh, our work. And um, Marianne right here, who is uh, supporting um, our video and publication uh, work. And then I'm most proud to, to have a group of uh, interns, uh, some undergraduate and some graduate students. And um, Sharon, would you kindly introduce each one or let them introduce themselves and make sure Hi, that I'm they, Lydia. yeah. I'm
I'm a senior at the University of Oregon. I'm Garth Pepper. I'm a senior at the University of California, Davis. I'm David Lisi. I recently finished my master's at the University of Exeter. So th this is part of um, the, the program, the internship program that we run for decades. And um, I, I think uh, th this investment in the future scholars and professionals is so important because tragically, I think they would have to deal with these issues for the next 100 years at least, and I'm optimist. So uh, again, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that uh, we continue with uh, the academic work. One, one more uh, co-sponsor that I would like to, to mention, uh, you have it on, on the program, is the Center for National Security Law at the University of Virginia School of Law with uh, Professor John Norton Moore and Professor Bob uh, Turner that we cooperate on many of the legal issues, although I think our academic work we discovered must be interdisciplinary because every discipline contributes to that particular uh, effort and our work is unclassified and our work is global. Uh, international cooperation is uh, really key academically and uh, already Kim spoke about some of the legal issues, for example, security uh, through justice uh, program and so on. Now, as a moderator, I would like to provide a very brief uh, context to our very rich uh, program. Uh, before I do so, uh, let me uh, introduce um, our distinguished uh, panel, and um, <coughs> they will uh, soon discuss their perspectives on what's, what's happening on that uh, scene, on the Olympic security uh, lessons uh, all the way from Munich to Sochi. Um, and some related issues. Now, the first uh, uh, speaker is going to be uh, Tom Esting, right here to my right. Not politically, uh, but by the way, uh, we, we're not, um, obviously, we're not politicians. Um, we are analysts, and therefore, it really means that we are trying to bring in different views and the dialogue um, with our colleagues in the academic and outside the academic community. We're not taking uh, positions, although um, we may have our own views about things, but at any rate, uh, I think the first uh, speaker will provide some context actually from the field. He was a former uh, senior official with the Office of Counterterrorism at the United States Department of State and also the FBI Foreign and Domestic Emergency Support Team program. He coordinated a number of Olympic uh, Games, uh, for example, in Sydney, Athens, and so on. The next one is Dr. Ariel Cohen, who is a senior research fellow in Russian and Eurasian Studies and International Energy Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Next to him is Peter Rudik, who is director of the Global Legal Research Center at the Law Library of Congress. And uh, I'm very pleased that both uh, Red Cohen and Peter spoke at our events uh, previously. Uh, next to <coughs> Peter is uh, Professor Ellen Zavian, who is professor of sports law at George Washington uh, University and she is also president of the Easy Negotiation Institute. Uh, next to her is uh, Bradley Shear, who is an adjunct professor in the MBA program at George Washington University and a member of the Harvard Law School uh, Center for the Internet and Society Online Media Legal Network. So we do have um, a very uh, rich, I think, uh, panel who are going to speak, and as I said, uh, as an academic, I, I cannot resist saying a few words or at least a few footnotes uh, to provide some context. By that I mean we are focusing today <coughs> on Olympic security, but 
this is only one of the challenges that societies are facing for a long time. The question is, what is new? Because, uh, as you know, King Solomon famously said that there is nothing new under the sun. We are facing, number one, Mother Nature, disasters, uh, all the way from hurricanes uh, to earthquakes and floods and so forth. And secondly, the man-made uh, disasters, uh, all the way from technological disasters uh, such as the uh, Chernobyl uh, nuclear disaster to remind us because we're dealing uh, with that region and we'll also focus on what's happening in the Ukraine. And then of course, uh, all the way from crime to piracy to terrorism and, and to war. I just want to remind all of us because again, you cannot focus only uh, primarily on the Olympics. So we have to, s to discuss it in a broader context. Uh, secondly, traditionally as academics and members of the society, we always uh, like to dedicate our work to the victims of terrorism. And uh, when I say the victim of terrorism uh, throughout the world, as we know, for example, in 9-11, uh, there were people from almost 100 different countries around the world. So we have to remember and not to forget the brutalization, the globalization. The last example of the victimization of society took place a few days ago in the Sinai uh, area. Uh, South Korean pilgrims uh, were attacked on a bus, suicide bombing uh, in the Sinai. They were on their way from Egypt on a pilgrimage to uh, Israel. And obviously we would like to express our sympathy for the families of the victims. Now, uh, in addition to that, I think we have to honor those who try to protect us around the world uh, from the first responders, for example, and in general, the civic society are uh, playing uh, a role. Now, secondly, on the academic level, uh, we try to develop over the years specific uh, capabilities, seminars, uh, for example, publications on the Olympics and sports. Um, for example, we had recently one event on the London uh, Olympics or other types of sports like the Boston Marathon and so forth. And academically, as we are going to see, there are actual courses in this particular area uh, dealing with uh, sports and uh, Olympics. Now, let me say just two words as a context to our discussion. As you can see on the list, uh, there are a number of events that took place uh, throughout the world um, in terms of the Olympic uh, Games. And uh, fundamentally, I think as participant observers of many of these events, we try to reach uh, certain lessons. I'm not going to go into the lessons at this point, but I'd like to mention two particular uh, Olympics and then move on on the contemporary situation. Uh, one, of course, is the 1972 uh, Munich uh, Olympics, uh, which I followed uh, academically very, very closely. And uh, actually, since uh, the inception uh, of the Games in 1896, this was the, the major, I think, 9-11, if you will, of the Olympic uh, Games, because uh, after all, as we know, the vision the vision and the spirit of the Olympic Games of competition um, and cooperation was really shattered at the Munich uh, attack. And politically, it's always even difficult to have the memory of the 11 athletes who were brutally uh, killed. And then the other uh, event that I think is relevant to our discussion today is the Moscow Olympics in 1980. 
And th this was a very special kind of Olympics because of the involvement of politics and the struggle for power, if you will, and all that. And it was at the time of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan back in 1979, and then the boycott uh, against the Olympics in Russia, and many countries participated, obviously including the US and Japan, was uh, Germany, China, the Philippines, Argentina, Canada, France, the UK, and so forth. So this particular event became very political. I would like to discuss today, hopefully on the Sochi uh, situation, uh, some of the implications uh, in terms of the political uh, and regional and global um, securities. And um, obviously we followed what happened in Sochi. We're going to go into some uh, details very soon. Uh, finally, let me just say one word about a related situation that is ongoing as we speak today. And this is the brutalization that is taking place in the Ukraine, in Kiev and some of the other uh, cities. I recall very vividly we had a number of academics uh, in, in Kiev and um, Yalta and elsewhere discussing the cooperation to combat terrorism. This is a different kind of brutalization that is happening, and I think we have to be very concerned about the outcome and again express the sympathy of all of us for those who were killed and, and wounded. And uh, hopefully the United States and the European uh, Union will find a way to resolve that terrible tragedy. If you look at that and you look at Syria and you look at Iraq and you look at Afghanistan, you look at Mali, all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea, what's happening uh, in Africa, in the Middle East and Asia, I think we have to be really concerned. So again, Olympics is very, very important, but unless we have stability and unless we have some sort of security, it's not going to work. And uh, I think we have to link the discussion of the sports uh, also with related issues, as I mentioned, like tourism, and uh, hopefully we can deal also with the implications, as I mentioned, uh, in regard to the Ukraine. So let me call on Tom first. Incidentally, you do have in the folder, you do have the bios of the speakers, so we are not going to go into details. Would you like to, yeah, to come up here? If you'd like me to, I will. Yeah, well, you're a captive audience. <laughs> That's true. Okay, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, kind of a fortuitous opportunity for me, just recently retiring from uh, federal government service after 36 years with the Marine Corps, State Department, and the FBI to be contacted by uh, my old colleague, Mike Kraft, <coughs> and Professor Alexander about the opportunity to come and speak to you a little bit today about some of my experiences, which uh, if you had asked me 30 years ago if I'd ever be here or doing any of these kinds of things, I certainly would have never thought so. So for you students in the room, just let your mind wander where you may be 30 years from now. You'll be amazed. Uh, 11 years into my Marine Corps career, the General Gray, who I think some of you know, a former commandant, basically answering a request for help from the counterterrorism office at state, Jerry Bremer. Uh, I got called and said, get up to Washington. You're going to work in counterterrorism. And frankly, that was the first I'd heard about it or ever thought about it. And that was in 1989. I spent uh, two and a half years as a Marine officer there, uh, detailed to state, and it was certainly an a eye-opening experience. <clears throat> and, but in those days, if you remember Ollie North's ex experience, I was, I was advised not to stay too long in Washington. And, and so two and a half years later, I went to Newport and uh, got some more education and, uh, and then came back to Quantico to teach but was called back by state uh, two years after I left about a job opportunity at the same time back in 1993 when opportunities to, uh, to reduce the size of the military were upon us and I uh, was able to retire early and take a position back at state 
So I started in a civilian capacity in 1993 and was there till 2006. What I want to talk about, and I'll get into the FBI piece of it, but I just want to talk a little bit about my experiences working uh, U.S. government coordination for overseas Olympic Games. I, I did have the opportunity, and they were both highlights of my time at State Department, to be involved in the preparation and the actual deployment of U.S. government uh, support to uh, two Olympic Games, both the Sydney Games in 2000 and the Athens Games in 2004. And as you know, seven years before uh, the Olympics, the, the venues and the cities are, are uh, identified. So those countries have seven years to prepare in all aspects of preparation. But of course, lately security is a, a significant uh, point of that. Uh, the Sydney Games prior to 9-11 with a very close ally, uh, were basically an exciting opportunity. We didn't. We we worried about worst case scenarios, and that's what you do. It's really risk management when you're looking at the at the Olympics. You were 72 Munich was a, a a watershed event, and it's really when our government and most all the governments in the world looked at their counterterrorism capabilities and realized that they were not really where they should be. They, we looked at how the West Germans responded to uh, what happened there. And as each government, and especially ours, looked at our own capabilities, we realized we had some work to do to make sure we had uh, capabilities to respond if similar things happened to us. So really, you look at that as the beginning of government, military, law enforcement uh, uh, analysis of where we needed to go to be able to respond to, to an event like that. Uh, so by 2000, we were you know, pretty advanced. We had certainly had our own summer games in 1996 in Atlanta, and I was working at State at the time. And you can imagine when, when you host a games in your own country, much like the Russians are going through now, it's a, it's a very big deal. You want it to come off perfectly. You want it to be something that the whole world looks at and um, admires and, and actually, you know, wants to come back and, and maybe visit those venues later, and that happens a lot. So, as we prepared for Sydney, we expected nothing but uh, you know, a good opportunity, but also we saw some potential th threats. But frankly, when you're working with a country like Australia, who is a close ally with very uh, advanced capabilities, the, the most that the U.S. government does is offer assistance. Uh, it's, it's that government's uh, show. It's their Olympic Games. And as the United States and other governments, we certainly, who have capabilities to pr provide assistance, offer it. But it's something that is uh, only is offered, and we attempt to provide whatever uh, assistance we can. We do uh, and are concerned about our athletes, frankly, because we know that the United States is a target. Uh, much like Israel and our other allies, we, we can always expect that if there is a threat to athletes, that it would be directed at some of those key countries that we, we know. So uh, with that in mind, we do have to work with the host government's security uh, elements to make sure that our athletes are, uh, are uh, provided for and that we have a liaison effort between uh, uh, our athletes and the host government's uh, security apparatus. And that function is provided by State Department's diplomatic security. So when we are actually overseas, our athletes are uh, have a liaison from the diplomatic security service who works with that particular team uh, of athletes and coordinates closely with that host government uh, security apparatus. So that's something that diplomatic security has been doing uh, as far back as, as we can remember. Now, if you remember the Sydney Games, it was really, it was People were amazed at how wonderfully they went, what a great uh, event it was, and, and all matter uh, of aspects. And, and certainly it was a highlight for me. Everything went well. There was no significant uh, events. But we certainly prepared, but again, in an advisory way, the Australians had a very good handle on the uh, security situation, and everything went well. But the next year, we had 9-11, and that certainly changed the complexion of preparations for Olympics after that. Now, if you remember, in 2002, we hosted the Winter Games in Salt Lake City, and there was concern about 
uh, that being so close to 9-11, but I've come to believe that uh, winter games are not necessarily the same venue as summer games uh, for, for a number of reasons. We could, I could joke about it, but uh, suffice to say that we just haven't had the, those kinds of problems, and we didn't in Salt Lake. But certainly as we were looking ahead to the Athens Olympics, we were concerned uh, for, because of the venue, because of the uh, just post 9-11 concerns, uh, the efforts that we made with the Greeks uh, were very significant. We uh, and across the board offered uh, training to the Greeks uh, through the anti-terrorism assistance program that State Department manages. Law enforcement training was also offered from the uh, FBI and the intelligence community. Uh, a significant presence uh, was there in working in coordination with the Greeks. And again, it went very well, but the preparation was far more significant than we had seen previously. And frankly, if you recall, the Greeks uh, spent somewhere in the order of $1.2 billion for security for the Athens Games. And in preparation, that was all looked upon as absolutely necessary. But when these games are over and nothing happens, and they go back and look at the $1.2 billion spent, there was a little bit of uh, coming back at the U.S. and saying that we perhaps were overstating the, uh, the terrorist threat at the games. And in, in the press and such, uh, reporting that the United States was seeing a terrorist behind every lamp post and uh, caused the uh, security preparations and the costs of, of which uh, to, to skyrocket, which affected, you know, the Greek bottom line. But that, that's the reality of uh, these things. When you're, risk, when you're doing risk management, it's kind of like purchasing insurance. Uh, I see the analogy where you, know, you can buy Lloyd's of London or you can buy the, the, the generic brand. And if it's lives and it's uh, security at stake, we normally want to, as we manage that risk, we want to uh, do everything that we think is prudent in terms of preparation. Um, you know, we can get in in the question and answer period about any specific questions you have. Uh, certainly, uh, we were very pleased uh, that after Athens we did not have any events. Uh, and we also were involved in London, but uh, again, it was similar to Australia with uh, the UK. Their capabilities are very advanced. They needed very little uh, support other than advisory and liaison assistance. So normally the United States is going to provide uh, advisory, law enforcement, uh, security, intelligence, uh, advice, and assistance as requested. But certainly uh, we see that the host government is responsible for the security of, of Olympics. And uh, we just offer what we can do, providing that, our, you know, that we have uh, confidence that our athletes are in good, uh, good hands and that we have liaison with those uh, with those uh, security forces involved in that so that uh, we feel comfortable that our athletes will be safe and secure. And, and that's what all, all countries do. Other countries also who have concerns about uh, perhaps being targeted uh, have a similar approach to uh, security for their uh, athletes. And uh, we've seen that all along. Um, I'm pleased so far to, to see that in Sochi things have gone well. Uh, other than the weather, which we can't control, 60 degrees on the slopes. But uh, you can see what an important uh, thing it is to have a safe and secure Olympic Games. And certainly we do, and there's been some press uh, that, that the U.S. has some uh, folks out there. But again, certainly in no other capacity other than advisory and liaison and assistance, uh, just working hand in hand with the host government as requested to uh, provide whatever uh, help that we can and to watch uh, our athletes and provide some you know protective liaison is what we refer to it as with them uh, I really uh, ha had great opportunity as I moved on to the uh, FBI in 2006 really because I met the uh, boss of the FBI's critical incident response group during the Athens games and uh, he made me an offer to come down and actually work some of these issues with the Bureau and I was in the crisis management unit, and just recently, as of 1 October of last year, there was a merger in the uh, crisis management and special events management unit within the FBI, and they're all in the same unit now. So uh, we actually put our crisis management and special events management efforts uh, together 
uh, as we look at these games, both you know domestically and internationally. And, and, and this is not just the Olympics. We also look at uh, other international events, such as the uh, World Cup coming up in Brazil. The uh, uh, Pan Am Games are always important the year before the Olympics because we usually have about a thousand U.S. athletes at the Pan Am Games, and it's a it's a prepara preparation for uh, Olympic pr uh, work. So those security issues that we have anywhere are hold true in uh, Pan American Games as well. So it's not just the Olympics where we uh, are taking a look at providing uh, assistance. It's, it's all international athletic events because, frankly, we know that terrorists, uh, while I would agree they're, they're not going away, and uh, as Professor Alexander mentions, uh, we do have to consider the threat and the possibilities and counter those uh, as best we can through... Uh, preparation and uh, countermeasures, and, and that's that's the effort. That's what it's about. It's uh, certainly across the board, but international athletic competitions are things that we especially want to be peaceful and without incident. So we make we make extra efforts within our government to ensure that that's the case. And I'll leave my remarks at that. And I thank you again for the opportunity to be here. It was a privilege. I just retired and I haven't been able to speak in, uh, in a venue like this for a long time and I really thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, and we will have a Q&A and, and I'm sure you will have, we'll have questions. Our next um, our panelist is Dr. Rev Cohen. Um, Rev, would you join the I will. Thank you very much, Professor Alexander, and uh, thank you for inviting me here for the Institute and for all the collaborators. I think the topic is extremely timely, and if this, the Ukraine uh, did not, uh, so to speak, uh, steal the show in a very tragic way, uh, that, that would be um, the leading uh, news story today. And also, thank goodness we did not have uh, an attack, and hopefully we won't have an attack, although what happened um, several weeks before the Olympics opened in Volgograd, um, a city on the Volga, uh, the historic Stalingrad, made me think that that was an early ringer for what might uh, happen uh, in Sochi, and uh, so far I'm glad nothing happened. Uh, let's put it in uh, the context. Um, I think that my predecessor here, uh, from formerly from the FBI and state, did a terrific job putting it in the context of Olympic event security. What I will try to do is now to shift focus um, at the threat. Uh, and the threat that the Russians are facing is the threat of uh, radical... Uh, Salafi, Wahhabi, uh, Islam that until recently wasn't homegrown. It was a transplanted brand. The Caucasus Islam that the Russian Empire confronted since it moved into North Caucasus in the second half of the 18th century uh, and then in the wars of the 19th century uh, is indeed a more moderate brand. It's the Sufi um, tariqat, uh, Sufi uh, orders uh, that uh, predominate in North Caucasus. Um, those wars uh, resulted in huge bloodshed. Hundreds of thousands of people, over time probably millions of people, perished uh, during the resistance of uh, different ethnic groups in North Caucasus to Russia. And the last episode started in 1994, the so-called First Chechen War, that was still mostly secular and nationalistic. The Chechens, under the leadership of General Johar Dodayev, wanted independence just like Ukraine and Georgia and Kazakhstan got independence. But there was a catch. Chechnya was not a union republic. It was an autonomous republic inside the Russian Federation, and um, President Yeltsin said, Niet. Um, 
I will not bore you now with all the details of how those events uh, enveloped. Suffice it to say that the then Defense Minister Grachov, Pavel Grachov, said that if he has a battalion of tanks, he will retake Grozny, the capital, in four hours. It took, unfortunately, two years. Over 100,000 victims and probably hundreds of thousands of refugees until a ceasefire, the Khasav Yurt ceasefire. Uh, and then a fascinating thing happened in front of our eyes. The nationalist movement of the Chechens transformed itself with the outside intervention of the likes of Ayman al-Zawahiri, the current head of al-Qaeda, then number two to Osama bin Laden, into an internationalized radical Islamist threat. So, 96, the war ends, 99, uh, Chechen rebels, uh, led by the late Shamil Basayev, invade the neighboring Dagestan, and these are already uh, people with uh, green bandanas and black flags with uh, the battle cry on the flags. So in three years, it transformed itself from a nationalist, uh, mostly secular uh, movement led by the former Soviet army officers and generals to um, a radical movement. As a result, what we saw were massive hostage taking, uh, hospitals were taking, hundreds and hundreds of people in places like Buinaksk and Pirvamaisk uh, were taken hostage. And then in 2002, there was the famous Dubrovka theater hostage taking, which, by the way, the Russian security forces botched on retake. Uh, they used un proven, untested um, uh, chiromucha uh, incapacitating gas, not a tear gas, something much more potent. The troops didn't understand how to use it. And most importantly, for me as a former army medic, they did not deploy forward medical care utilities around the theater. They did not instruct the... Uh, first uh, responders, that they're going to use the gas, supposedly for the reasons of secrecy, and they did not have specialized equipment around the theater uh, and not, did not have specialized transport. As a result, uh, over 120 people died in a rescue, um, and uh, there were some rumbling, but it was quickly... Um, suppressed. The, I did not see any unclassified Russian lessons learned from Dubrovka. Next, in 2004, uh, I was among a group of uh, Russia experts who arrived uh, to uh, Moscow and then to uh, a region of Russia, Novgorod, and instead of having a fancy conference to our horror, the school in Beslan was taken Again, uh, with somebody with minimal military background, I was horrified. There was no perimeter established around the school. So people were walking, shown on national TV, uh, real time, people walking in and out uh, of the uh, uh, school where uh, hundreds of school children were taken hostage. Again, the botched uh, retake and uh, th over 300 uh, kids and some personnel perished in the retake. Not very impressive, no serious investigation, no public lessons learned. And in the meantime, you have trains, planes, airports, automobiles, and the Moscow Metro being targeted again and again with uh, suicide bombers uh, and bombs. Um, the uh, high-speed trains between Moscow and um, St. Petersburg were hit twice. Uh, two planes to Volgograd uh, were hit by female suicide bombers who bribed the security guard or the Russian equivalent of TSA 
with about $100 or $150 bribe not to open their bags and the planes went down, um, et cetera. So uh, the threat is both homegrown and internationally connected. And clearly Sochi is a huge um, high priority target. Uh, Volgograd apparently was a suicide bomber with a control present on the ground. Um, and actually Volgograd um, was targeted three times. The police headquarters was hit and then there was a bus and I think a, a trolley bus, uh, the, the central uh, train station and a bus uh, hit. Uh, and that made me very nervous because th this is awfully close, time-wise to Sochi, and um, the MO would probably be very similar unless they go for something much more sophisticated. And I have a scenario in my mind, which I don't even want to, sh to share in an open forum, how they could hit it. Okay, so why it didn't happen so far, thank God? It didn't happen because for Mr. Putin it's very personal. This is the show of President Putin. He did not save money, uh, and you've all seen the reports, um, whether you trust them or not, that the cost of Sochi is the equivalent of all the Winter Olympic Games combined. Uh, there are reports by the Russian opposition, which clearly has a bone to pick here, claiming that about half of the money was stolen. I recall a conversation with uh, the late uh, Vitaly Shlykov, uh, colonel, retired colonel of the GRU, who became an advisor uh, to now deposed uh, Minister of Defense. And I said, hey, Vitaly, you know, there are a lot of publications that 30 to 40 percent of your military procurement is kickbacks. I said, no, 50, 60 percent. Uh, so, um, um, this is something to uh, look for the Russian authorities, clearly, if they can, and that brings a whole different issue of the rule of law. Uh, what was uh, the cost and what was the, uh, the additional cost of Sochi? But so far, because it's so important for the boss, because they put 100,000 uh, security personnel from all over Russia into Sochi, thank goodness nothing happened. However, it raises a question. If this 100,000 people are in Sochi, how does it leave Moscow? How does it leave St. Petersburg? Are they uh, open uh, to attacks? Uh, I think we have only three days because the, con the concluding ceremony is on the 23rd or the 24th. Uh, so if the Russians dodge the bullet, literally, on this, I think this is great success. Um, in terms of all the other things, optics of Ukraine, the alleged attack on Pussy Riot, etc. I'm not going to get into that. That's my Russia hat. That's not my um, terrorism studies and uh, Islam in Russia hat. I will have to put a plug for a forthcoming monograph on the lessons Russia learned from the insurgency in North Caucasus, forthcoming any day now from the U.S. Army War College. If you go uh, to their website, probably in the next couple of weeks, that piece will be there. Um, and I can only say, looking down the line. And this is sort of lessons learned from Sochi and beyond. Every large scale sports event in any country that people have a bone to pick with, Australians who send troops to Afghanistan, Brits, us, you name it. I don't even know if you have a global soccer event in the Gulf. Somebody may say that there's a fatwa against playing soccer or against watching soccer on television. So nobody is safe. Iran is not safe because Sunni, some radical Sunnis are picking bone with Iran. Uh, the Emirates will not be safe because, I don't know, Hezbollah will pick a bone on that nobody is safe anymore, and specifically folks who have indigenous forces, be it Algerians, be it Russians, uh, whoever, uh, people in Africa, Kenyans, 
whoever has these radical forces have the personnel pool to recruit suicide bombers and to target these events. Finally, Russia has a systemic problem with local Muslims who are increasingly radicalized. I was talking to the current president, or the nominated president, they appoint presidents, they don't elect them. Uh, the current uh, president of Dagestan, I chatted with him in September. Dagestan is an autonomous republic next to Chechnya. And I said, Mr. Abdul, Abdul Atipov, uh, what is the percentage of your population, especially the young people, who support the Wahhabi Salafi ideology and not the traditional Caucasus bred uh, Sufi ideology that sort of can coexist with a lot of racism and discrimination that are prevalent in Russia. And Mr. Abdul Latif of old Soviet Communist Party Central Committee apparatchik said 25 to 30 percent. I went and looked at research and it is 25 to 30 percent. It's a huge number. It's a huge number. If you take the population of North Caucasus at 8 million and add to it the diasporas in Russian cities, it's probably another 4 million or 5 million. So we're looking at 13 percent. Third of 13 percent is over 4 million. So I'm not saying all these people are potential terrorists, but there's a percentage among the supporters who can recruit it and brainwash. That technology is there. It is a social technology. When you take a person, you isolate him or her, brainwash, show them videos, explain to them why sacrificing your life uh, in the path of jihad is a good thing, and bingo, unfortunately, that's what. So what I consider uh, is that Russia has hundreds of thousands of potential recruits like that, and they have to be very careful as they're going to a big world um, soccer championship, I think in 2018, and any other events, uh, this is a test. If they pass the Sochi test, there is a hope that other events like that can be conducted safely in the Russian Federation. If, God forbid, something happens, they need to seriously reassess. And there, actually, the current finger pointing, the anti-American propaganda, we saw 84 minute long film uh, on Channel One just two days ago, which is viciously anti-American, that has to stop. They need to understand that they are, after all the rhetoric, a part of the same civilization that is threatened by these evildoers. They need to understand that, that there's much more upside in cooperating with us, with the Europeans, with the Israelis, with the Indians, with the Chinese, than to point fingers and, and say that we are somehow supportive of this disgusting terrorist threat. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alexander, for inviting me and for organizing this event. And I will follow my co-panelists who started to talk about their background and what they are used to do at their work. I'm, I came here from the Law Library of Congress. Everybody knows that we are the largest law library. We have three million of books. But in addition to these three million of books, 60% of our books are in foreign languages. And even more, we have a staff of people, American attorneys, who had training in foreign countries, who are admitted to practice in foreign countries, who can interpret these foreign laws, who can explain to American legislators and American public how to resolve a problem according to laws of a foreign country. And uh, you can hear from my accent that I am covering, in addition to my administrative duties, I'm covering Russia, former Soviet countries, and I'm a legal specialist for these jurisdictions. So being the only government employee at this panel, I have to start my talk about legal framework, which was created by the Russian authorities in order to make these games secure, with a disclaimer that everything what I will say will be on my own. I will not make the library responsible for what I am talking here. And before we will start to talk about uh, lessons learned from Munich, 
I have to say that in order to be a good learner, you have to define terms. You have to come to the definitions. And recently, it was a kind of confusion how different terms, different definitions were understood by the organizers of the game, games. For example, they promised to, to make these games most memorable, and they made them most warm. They promised to have the most impressive games, these games turned to be the most expensive. They promised to have the most secure games, and these games are probably the most regulated and the most monitored in uh, regard to the behavior of athletes, uh, spectators, journalists. Current laws, and I will talk mostly about three major uh, regulations which were passed uh, during the last uh, half a year, which control who is coming to the games, what people are doing there, how they can <coughs> behave there, what they can say there. It's not enough to buy a ticket to go to the Olympic Games. In order to attend an event, you have to p get a special spectator's pass. In order to get the spectator's pass, people in advance should submit copies of their entry tickets and uh, a special application and uh, a lot of personal information. And, says, uh, and nobody can be sure that they will get this pass. Everyone who is older than two years old is required to have a special badge, which is called this pass. And there are uh, reports that people who were somehow involved in different opposition-related activities were denied access to the Olympics, and they didn't come to Sochi. But even if somebody was able to get this spectator's pass and come to Sochi, there is so-called Regulation 1156, which was passed in December, entered into force in January, which is called Rules of Spectators' Behavior at Official Sporting Events. And this regulation defines where people can stay at the stands, what they can say, how they will express support to their team. For example, anything what is bigger than 16 inches in any dimension cannot be brought. The regulation defines how spectators, uh, what kind of clothes they can wear or not to wear in order to attend an event, what kind of food they can take, uh, what, kind, uh, what bottles, uh, even plastic bottles are prohibited there. Mm -hmm. And especially it says that uh, drums, loudspeakers, noise and music equipment cannot be taken to the stands ex unless special uh, uh, permission was received. In order to receive this re permission, people need to submit again re applications two days in advance. Within the next 24 hours, these permissions will be issued. Police, uh, local police will be notified. Uh, they will get a special uh, designated place on the stands. And a person who will be allowed to keep this uh, equipment or a drum or whatever will be defined and this person will be there. It sp specifies that no wording in any language can be put on this equipment. And there are special provisions regarding banners and flags. For example, nothing can be longer than two yards. All uh, motors, uh, inscriptions on these uh, messages on these banners should be t in Russian language or translated into Russian. And it's not enough just to translate. It doesn't matter that your team doesn't understand Russian. You have to translate and may bring an official notarized certificate that your translation that your translation is exactly what you want to uh, what message you want to submit. In regard to the flag, there is a special requirement: all flags should be fireproof. And since the fireproof certificate needs to be present also and uh, shown to local police, otherwise uh, a person will be removed from the stands. If uh, under all the, because of all these restrictions, somebody will decide not to go to the games and will send something to his uh, friends who went to Sochi, it's also not so easy. Uh, there is a special regulation. All mail sent to Sochi should be unsealed. And you c probably read recently in New York Times that Chebani yogurt was not allowed uh, to be received by American athletes because uh, some postal service regulations were violated. I would say that many of these uh, regulations are in violation of original Russian laws. But 
they were passed. Recently, in Guardian, there was an article saying that there is a deafening silence in Sochi in regard to political protests, political statements, and uh, it's not, it's obvious why it happened so. Last August, Putin issued a special decree which prohibited all non-Olympics related gatherings in Sochi and all and neighboring territories until March, end of March. Then later this uh, decree was amended and a special area was uh, designated about 10 miles away from Sochi for uh, conducting protest events. But at the same time, Russian law was not revoked, which re allows people to conduct single man protests, uh, piquets, and uh, other events. But uh, local police strongly prosecute such events, and you can uh, see again reports that people were detained for doing such type of activities. And uh, there is a third uh, regulation which I mentioned to you. It was passed last November, which regulates eavesdropping in Sochi. 11,000 cameras, drones, and uh, eavesdropping. Probably it is another reason why you can uh, hear this deafening silence in the region. Probably you read the report that all computers of our NBC team, which covers uh, Olympics, were hacked immediately as they just connected to free wi to public Wi-Fi in Sochi. And to pro that is because there was uh, in November regulation called on specifics of providing communication services in Sochi. And this uh, regulation authorizes full collection of data and metadata collected by operators and uh, providers of communication services. So the regulation uh, reg specifies that all journalists, members of official delegations, athletes, judges, and spectators are subject to this control. All uh, regulation, according to regulation, all records of connections, m sending messages, and even uh, information on payment conducted to get these uh, communications sh shall be re recorded in a special database. And this database and or, or this data shall be <coughs> kept for, three, for the next three years, pr allowing 24-7 remote access to the Russian Federal Security Service. Russian, two Rus major Russian investigative journalists uh, reported about this system in, uh, in the Western media. And what was the response of the Russian government? The official Russian government website, Voice of Russia, published uh, on, the, on its website statement saying, don't be scared of phone tapping during Sochi. It's for your own safety. <laughs> well, maybe it is for safety, but uh, to what degree it is within the legal field. Russia doesn't have its own federal uh, intelligence court of, of, of review. So who will monitor use of this data? Especially Russian own Supreme Court two years ago issued guidance which said that all metadata collected in regard to electronic communications, telephone numbers, and information on uh, electronic tra uh, traffic should be considered as uh, personal private information. And the collection of this information requires court orders. Of course, in the case of Sochi, it is not done. So is lesson learned? I don't know. Olympic Games are continuing. Nothing happened yet. Hopefully, nothing will happen until the end. But we should shall make sure that uh, measures which were undertaken by the Russian government are within the legal field, and uh, security is not uh, becoming abuse or misuse of protection of rights, and protection of rights of those who are protected is probably another question in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. 
I, I keep asking um, Dr. Alexandra, why does he keep picking me to come back? I, I, I need to do... Uh, well, uh, I'll tell you, <laughs> first of all, uh, loyalty to the academic work. You know, I, I ran this program at GW on terrorism. But more importantly, to indicate that the university really uh, sponsored areas of interest to the society. We're dealing with sports. Right. So when we talk about sports, we have to deal with security as well. By the way, not only of the athletes, but also the audience and participants. But it's all yours. Well, I'm always honored to come back. And after hearing all the uh, speakers prior to me, I'm, I have this sense of fear uh, to come up here and share with you that uh, our students go to the Olympics every year with Professor uh, Delpi Narati, and I'm happy to say they're back today, mm -hmm. so I can talk about this a little bit more freely, but they go and they experience all the Olympic movement from a sponsorship, a marketing standpoint, a security standpoint, which we never used to cover. And so they get to meet with CEOs from different sponsors and vendors, and it's a wonderful program, but mm -hmm. I remember my students talking a couple of weeks ago, did you contact the State Department? We have to get our names in and we can't go without it. And I remember 15 years ago when we were taking the students, that wasn't even a discussion. And so what has happened in my own personal class, I've been teaching since 19, I think 96 or something of that sort, that I never used to even cover security. Most of my class was antitrust law, contracts, torts, and so forth in the sports arena. And safety was the closest S that we came to from the security standpoint. Now I co-teach one of my classes with uh, another professor at GW who's sadly retiring, uh, Professor Greg Shaw, who also was in the military. And he um, teaches in the risk management side of the engineering department at GW. So if you would have asked me 15 years ago would I have ever really focused one of my 16 classes on security and risk management and so forth, I probably would have said, are you kidding me? Antitrust is the most important thing that's going on. So um, without further ado, I want to cover various things that I would tell my students in my class that we cover security. So one of the things is, I'm gonna focus on five things, just so everyone knows the beginning to the end. The Safety Act, which we talked a little bit about last time. The, um, the International Security Events Group, ISEG, which Tom mentioned. And the ICSS, which is an organization in Qatar, which we'll talk about a little bit, and I'll show you their website. Then what's happening in Sochi with our students and the athletes and so forth. And then what does this mean for future games? Because when I teach, I basically tell my students, this is all the precedent and the current, but it's going to be up to you to figure out where we're headed in the future. Because I'm hoping I'm long retired, like Tom, very soon. <laughs> so I'm pushing them to be the creative ones. So let's talk about the Homeland Security Act of 2002, where they really began to build this, and I'm going to read it because it's a very long title. I, I thought the USOC had acronyms that were long until I got into the terrorism world, and those acronyms uh, stumped me quite often. The Support Anti-Terrorism by Fostering Effective Technologies Act of 2002. So it's also known as the Safety Act, so we'll stick to that since it's two letters and SA, easy enough. And so what was this act? This act was really uh, passed by Congress, obviously to protect from anti-terrorism, but it was more about fostering technologies in the anti-terrorism community to really foster development of technologies. Because what companies are gonna get in and really develop the R&D that's needed for these technologies that, that facilities need and so forth if they know they're going to be sued if it fails. So the act basically creates an immunity for the technology companies to come into the foreplay and to begin developing really unique facility technologies. 
So who was the first team to um, see if you're, you were paying attention last year? Who was the first team that ever got certified under the Safety Act? Do you remember? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, the New York Yankees. Should not surprise you. And uh, George is probably looking down and saying, of course, we're always the first in everything. So the Yankees got a Certificate Act, which actually, a uh, Certificate uh, under the Safety Act, which actually expires in 2017. And what this does, it, it promotes the uh, creation and deployment of anti-terrorism technologies and, uh, in their facilities. So in their case, they own their facility. But don't be fooled because there are some stadiums that aren't owned by the team. They're rented for a dollar in exchange for tax breaks and so forth. So you really have to know who owns the facility and is this Safety Act certificate really worthwhile because there's a cost to it. The cost is deploying all these technologies on a yearly basis. They have to keep them updated. They have to report in to Homeland Security. And um, every so many years, they have to renew. But there's another side to it that's sort of fascinating. Once they get certified, their insurance premiums go down. So I would love to see the cost of certification and implementing those technologies to how much their insurance goes down. And why does their insurance go down? Because now they're immune from a lawsuit. If a terrorist act should happen in their facility, the patrons, the vendors, the sponsors cannot sue. And I know Tom's ready to jump in because you're going to know much more about this than me. But I was a little bit shocked when the Yankees were one of the first because I kind of felt the act was really for the technologies to be immune. But sports always jumps in if there's some, something adv advantageous because we're all about winning in, in, at any cost sometimes. So since then, there's been other sports entities that have gotten certificates under the Safety Act. The Mets, which comes under the Queens Ballpark Company, and basically it's designed to detect, deter, prevent, respond, mitigate acts of terrorism at City Field. But interestingly enough, it doesn't only cover the events that are associated with the Mets. It covers all events that are at that facility. So that means non-season, special events, concerts, and so forth. It also um, hires and trains their employees and their independent contractors to maintain that certificate. But not to be outdone by the Mets, across the water of my hometown, New Jersey, the new Meadowlands Stadium is also certified under the Safety Act. Game days, non-game days, and special events. And you all know the Super Bowl took place there, so they were protected as well. Major League Baseball also took out a certificate for the Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City, which involved the All-Star event for 2013. And the National Football League should not be outdone by Major League Baseball. So the NFL puts together guidelines, standards, and credentials that the facilities and the team owners near need to um, adhere to. But the teams and the facilities need to get their separate certificate. The NFL has their certificate more to cover things like the Super Bowl or the Super Bowl events that surround it, as well as even down to the parking lot at a facility is covered under the Safety Act. But the NFL has this security evacu um, evaluation and compliance program that they then educate the security teams at each facility of each team. So what does this mean? Is this the only way that teams are sort of protecting themselves? Well, we've got some traditional ways, which is a ticket waiver. So every time you turn around your ticket, you see a waiver that says even act of terrorism is now in the waiver, didn't used to be, that you are waiving your rights to sue that particular team or facility. The other way is just um, federal or state immunity. Immunity has existed for federal and state entities, and like a lot of 
you know, like I said, a lot of stadiums are owned by the state and not necessarily the team. So there's some immunity as well there. And then lastly, you can't forget just traditional workers' comp insurance and how the workers are protected versus the vendors and the independent contractors. You try to push the liability over to the vendors and the ICs. So wrapping that up, I think that there is going to be more and more facilities and teams being certified under this Safety Act. And so last year I came with one. This year I've got, I think, six or seven. So maybe by next year, if you invite me back, I'll have about 20 more or something of that sort. So let's go on to a little bit of what Tom was talking about, which is the International Security Events Group. Is it called ISEG? Is that how you pronounce it? That's what it's called. I didn't really mention it. I just talked okay. about diplomatic security role. Right. And so it's they, about... They chair it. So. Exactly. And it's so it's a group that has gotten together. Uh, it's under the Homeland Security Group. And it's basically 20 so agencies that get together and discuss main events. And I think what has been said here before, it is not about the Olympics. It's about where any event that aggregates a large crowd that could be attractive, particularly if the media is going to provide a stage for their, um, their acts. So basically, this ISEG group coordinates things like credentials, travel warnings, which you all heard regarding uh, Sochi and the travel to Russia, Evacuation plans are planned out. Uh, if we have an event here, how are visas going to be processed? And they kind of estimated at the uh, Italian, the, the games in Italy, it was about $16 million spent in security through the ISEG group. So that's quite a bit. Um, but I do agree what's been said here, that the Winter Games does not – attract as much as the summer games do and be quite honest with you the summer games have a lot more athletes I represented the women's soccer players the women's softball players and uh, it was in 1996 and there was no security I, I got into many events without tickets if I can say that and today that wouldn't be the case at all so world has changed what about the the ICSS so if we can just look at their home page, the ICSS, I got to know after I spoke last year, I was introduced to this group, and I was like, what do you do? They're the International Center for Security, Safety, and Integrity in Sport. And I've gotten to know uh, the lead people, and they're opening an office here in D.C., and the gentleman that founded it is Mohammed Hanzab, H-A-N-Z-A-B. And basically, they want to be the global sort of meeting hub for safety, security, and integrity. So it's easy to think about what's security, because we've been talking about it today. But how does safety play a role? And this, this ICSS is in Qatar, so it's sort of off the beaten path but they have clearly funded this to a considerable amount. Security, easy, safety. We're talking about maybe concussions that have been in the news quite a bit um, and where that's going to lead for different sports, particularly in soccer, which is a global sport because very few people watch NFL, even though in this country it's the biggest thing. And the other thing that integrity really goes to, I was kind of – really diving into what what is integrity of sports but it kind of you know and i'd love to hear what the panel has to say interjects into security a little bit it talks about price fixing and the integrity of the pureness of the sport and why i think that connects a little is because the individuals that are paying off in the gambling and the price fixing to throw a card at a soccer game uh, or pay off a ref because there's a gamble that's going to pay off X, a lot of times those same individuals are also involved in the terrorism side. So I see that as a joint area that maybe hasn't been mentioned, 
but should be considered going forward. If integrity of sports is hampered, people will not go to watch a game because people go to games because of the unknown factor and the fairness. And so it is critical that we keep integrity within our sports. Otherwise, viewership will decline and participation will decline. The other thing that's been mentioned is what about the Sochi games themselves? So I know um, Peter talked about a lot of things that I had no idea, all these rules and regulations. I used to say by the time you read all the rules and regulations, the games will be done, right? And, um, and we can't forget about the Paralympic Games. So even though there's three days left of the Olympic Games, I represented Paralympic athletes and I never like to forget them because they're just as important or slightly more important to me in many ways. But in the process of bidding for the games, there's different sections in the process. And there's one section which is called Stage 1, Theme 12. And in that section, it absolutely mandates that the hosting uh, country guarantees, makes two guarantees. One of it is to um, the highest government authority is going to oversee the safety and peaceful celebration of the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. So there's other things that come into factor, whether it's customs, immigration, formalities, environment, the weather is also considered, finance, marketing, sport, but obviously those two guarantees are important. What does that guarantee mean? Well, it means that in this case, the IOC required uh, Russia to create a separate entity, sort of a committee, and it was a, an Olympic security steering committee. And this coordination center, this hub, was going to be establishing the security plan and delivering it. And this interagency operational sort of headquarters hub had the FSB, which is the Federal Security Service, was the lead agency, the interior, which would be the police ministry, the emergencies ministry, the defense ministry, and other bodies. So what does that come down to? Well, it was reported that there was about 100,000 uh, troops, vehicles, aircraft, and so forth in Sochi. But rumbles have said that there were much more than what were reported. So what does the U.S. do? The U.S. obviously wants to get the athletes over there and home safely. But what's interesting that has evolved in the last few years is national governing bodies of each sport have begun to hire their own security teams. And that is so important because the NGBs have never budgeted for that type of private security. And for example, the ski and, sa and skate, I was going to say skateboard, snowboard, um, they hired a company called Global Rescue. But when we take a step back and we think about the, the national governing bodies that don't have that budget to protect their athletes on an individual basis, does it mean the athletes may consider or the agents to the athletes might consider providing some private protection? The NHL sent their own security team over for the NHL players, and usually, the leagues have former FBI individuals running their security team. So they're in good hands. But what about curling, bobsled, luge, and all those other people? We really have to think about how we're going to reinvent. Are the NGBs going to get together and create an insurance pool? Are they going to create a pool where they would hire a security company at a much better rate than doing it individually? These are things that I want my students to think about going forward. Is this an area that they're interested in and they can be in the forefront? Lastly, what's the future of the games? Well, if you remember, Anita de France sued um, the USOC when Carter boycotted the games uh, in the 70s. And the courts basically said it's a privilege to perform at the games and not a right and therefore she lost her case. 
She sits on the board of the IOC, so I don't think she lost too much, and she's very powerful. But I think what's more important about it is, you know, the athletes, if we boycott the games for any reason for safety purposes, we say we're not going to send a contingency over. If the athletes would sue that they're going, we have some precedent law that states it's a privilege, not a right. So what does it mean for D.C. and Baltimore, which is where we are? Well, we're looking at bidding for a summer game. Uh, and that will be critical because the security alone in, you know, sort of a non-D.C. area is massive. Can you imagine the security that we would need here and what kind of budget we would need? So look for that bid and that discussion, and maybe in a couple years we can talk about it if they formally uh, submit their bid. And really what's the best um, – the best place in the country. I think that's something that's really going to be considered as well. Where's the best place in the country that we can have a secure location? I think Utah was fairly simple, whereas D.C., Baltimore, and Richmond bid would be massive, and we might have to bring Tom out of retirement to do <laughs> those three areas. <laughs> as long as I come with you, I'm good to go. Uh, and then, obviously, I talked about what's the national governing body is going to do, but what are the IFs going to do? So the IFs are the international federations like FIFA, and are they going to pool their resources as well? Are they going to begin to put a budget together? And what are universities going to do and, and to seek um, perhaps certificates under the Safety Act as well? And lastly, I would just say that you know we're glad our students came back. And they're safe and sound. And actually, GW Media told us that we should not speak about security and terrorism while our students are over there. So I thank you for having it on the perfect day, which is today. And they came back yesterday. Everything was planned. Everything was planned. <laughs> so, um, and, and of course, one of the proudest things I can tell you is my next speaker is a former student of mine. So someone was paying attention in my class. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ellen. Um, I am a former student of Ellen's um, approximately uh, 18 years ago, I think it was, a long time ago. But uh, I'd like to give a little um, a bit about my background because that might be helpful because everyone else here today has spoken a little bit about their own background. Uh, I'm a practicing lawyer. I also teach at uh, George Washington University. I teach a sports management class in the MBA program. And I focus a lot of my practice on privacy and security issues. And I deal a lot with uh, digital crisis management and um, digital risk management. And those are some issues that I think um, these past Olympics have really brought about. And several of our speakers here today have focused really on the physical aspects. And I believe Peter spoke about some of the issues with um, the digital issues that um, especially the laws that uh, have been put in place so what I'm going to try to do is talk about a little bit about the role of the media along with some of the different social and digital media issues that have come into play these past Olympics because I think uh, or the current Olympics that are going on because I think that's very helpful in really understanding where our security concerns um, are currently and where they're going to be moving forward um, I mean uh, when, when you look back I think you have to first think about um, the media's role in the 72 Olympics in Munich and that was really the television age and you have to think about well wait a minute um, the security issues were focused on okay how do we protect protect this venue and no one really knew what was happening and of course um, we all know what happened in, in Munich and from 72 the next I think biggest step was in 96 um, in Atlanta because that was really the cable age um, especially with um, Atlanta being the hub of um, uh, Ted Turner's media empire and so you have to think about the Olympics at that aspect was focused a lot on cable issues well uh, here comes 9-11 um, and another aspect of my background is that uh, I was down at the World Trade Center in that area 9-11 and I became homeless um, because of the terrorist attacks I saw the whole thing and actually took some photographs and ran for my life with along with tens of thousands of other New Yorkers and my experience that day really um, gave me the impression and, and the knowledge about what 
um, some of the things that we all have to think about as practitioners of trying to protect ourselves and um, what are the possible things that could po potentially happen on the ground for different types of events. And the, the problem is that you have to um, try to plan for the unexpected. Um, I believe it was um, Peter, I think, might have said something to the effect that um, the uh, issues in, in Greece with the amount of money that they spent was exorbitant and the U.S. may have been so-called um, sounding the alarm that they need to spend that type of money. Well, the thing is, I'm glad they spent that type of money. And even though some people come out and say, you know what, we spend way too much for security. Well, my feeling is that you can never be too safe. As a parent of two children, I never want them to have to experience those types of issues um, that I did on 9-11 and unfortunately the people that perished that day. And I never want to ever see anyone who, um, anyone who participates at the Olympics or attends the games to ever experience the types of things that happen in Munich and also in Atlanta. So as far as I'm concerned, um, the amount of money that is spent at the Olympics w regarding um, security is very well spent and my hope is that there's more attention paid to the digital issues and the digital um, security um, of the Olympics because in my opinion that's something that's going to be a growing threat that many of the members in this room are going to have to deal with and focus with. Um, but when you think about um, so, some of these other issues I want to talk about um, in 2008 um, the Beijing Olympics that was the first time that we had the so-called um, social media age it was the beginning well, in 2010 and 2012, then we had the so-called Social Media Olympics, and that's when um, a lot of organizers start to think, well, how are we going to protect our athletes uh, um, basically from saying dumb things online? Well, besides that, you have people that want to do some evil things that are posting videos on YouTube about the things that they want to do at the Olympics. And then you have these Olympics, the 2014 Olympics in Sochi, when they are really called, in my opinion, it's the Surveillance Olympics. Because now we're at a point where we're trying to figure out, okay, what's the best way to protect us? Well, we have this big issue, uh, privacy versus security. How much is too much? Um, I've personally uh, advocated for very strong privacy laws in this country. Um, the social media username and password laws that have been enacted in about 15 states and introduced in 40 and in Congress, I helped start that uh, trend. However, um, I see how important it is to really understand, you know what? You have to give up some of your privacy to ensure that you have security. And that is something that I think everyone in this room understands. And unfortunately, there are some groups that don't understand that as much that, you know what, as, as well as we want to protect our Olympians and as well as we want to protect um, those who attend the games, they're going to have to give up some of their privacy to ensure that they are secure in, um, in attending the games and the fact that Good, um, good things will happen while they're at the games, meaning they'll win Olympic uh, medals uh, without having to worry about some of the overriding terrorist um, issues that are out there. Um, so those are some of the issues that I'm going to talk about. And since the hour is getting late, I'm just going to be very brief. I have a couple of slides that I actually would like to sh share with you if you can queue up. Um, like when I brought about the digital surveillance. Well, it was, brought, it was spoken about earlier that um, approximately 45 to $50 billion have been spent in total for the Olympics. How much of that is um, with digital surveillance? I just don't know. And obviously in the next uh, couple of years, maybe some hard figures will come out. But um, as Peter said earlier, just about everything that is being done um, digitally in Sochi is being collected, all the metadata, and somebody is looking at it. Um, and the FSB has some kind of program, I believe it's called SORM, SORM, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and I, I believe it um, does the same type of thing as Air, Air Prism, which came out in the um, uh, documents that uh, Snowden ended up uh, leaking to the press last year. So it's these types of issues, digital surveillance, and making sure that we're well protected that I believe is very important and is something that we're only going to increase with um, the fact that everyone here is using one of these. How many people here have a cell phone? I believe everyone does. If I'm not mistaken, I don't think anyone in this room does not live without one of these cell phones. And there was a really funny th um, piece that uh, Jerry Seinfeld did, I believe it was last night on, um, on The Tonight Show, where he talked about cell phones, how everyone is walking around with them. And that's how it is at the Olympics and at every single sporting event these days. Everyone has one of these. So 
that's why we have to think about um, these issues collectively and try to figure out what are the best practices out there in trying to protect our athletes and trying to protect the attendees and the people who are actually on the ground physically protecting um, those people at the Olympics. Next slide, please. Now, if those of you who are active social media users, one thing that I would always recommend is that you have to, you have to really understand what's going on out there. And one of the hashtags that really has come into play is called um, Sochi Fail. Um, basically, there's been a whole bunch of different, very interesting things that have happened while at Sochi. Um, one of the things which this shows is um, the pussy um, riot band members. Um, I guess you could call them pussy rioters um, because of some of the things that they did. Um, I mean, they're just a rock band who um, was protesting against um, some of the human rights issues out in, um, in Russia, um, especially the anti-gay laws um, that are in place and some of the other um, issues. And they were arrested. They were put in jail, a couple of the members, for a little bit. And yesterday, I believe it was, they came out and they... Um, they did some type of, uh, def like all of a sudden they did some, some little um, de facto little um, performance and the Cossacks came out and they literally beat them up. And those types of issues, it, it got a lot of press and it went, it went viral. And if you take, go online and you do take a look at Sochi Fail, you'll see um, everyone talking about that. And what a lot of people need to realize is that when you make a big deal about something, especially in this day and age, with social media, it becomes a big deal. If the Russian security forces would have just ignored this and just let them come out and did their little um, did their little dance and their song, it wouldn't have made a big deal, and I would not be talking about it here today. And the entire world will not be, would have not have covered the issue. So, it's not only that, but there was a couple other interesting issues where there was a bobsledder who got stuck in the bathroom. I don't have that on the slide, but basically, he got stuck in the bathroom and he he literally came out. Um, and bull, uh, barrel through the door. And then one of the other issues that literally popped up was in the beginning, I don't think I had that as a slide, but there were two toilets that were next to each other. And as far as a privacy slash security issue, y there could be some um, argument on whether or not that is a privacy security issue for this type of uh, forum, but it just goes to show you anything that you do in this day and age could end up online. Um, yeah, that's um, what I was talking about. So these are the issues that you have to understand when you're planning for the Olympics that you can't just prepare for um, the so-called physical security, but you also have to keep in mind the digital security and the digital issues out there because that is becoming more important, in my opinion, um, when you're trying to figure out what's the best way to deploy our resources. Uh, next slide, please. But it, it's something that I find very fascinating, and I really um, deal a lot with this um, with my different clients. Here, this is um, when I talk about different types of uh, security issues. For example, this this deals with the uh, Boston uh, Marathon bombing, that tragic uh, um, case that happened last year, which I'm pretty sure everyone here knows about. But you have to think about, well, wait a minute. Um, we, we have all this really cool crowdsourcing information. Everyone is posting photos online. Um, everyone is taking a picture with one of these. And how can we work together to try to find the so-called terrorists or the bombers? Well, the problem was that social media can be used for good and that you can help with security and hopefully try to find the bombers but it also can be misinterpreted and unfortunately because of some of the crowdsourcing the New York Post and some other di some other um, di different media outlets incorrectly named um, the wrong bombers so it's a double-edged sword social media and digital platforms and tools so that's why you really need to think about how are we going to handle these issues when we're dealing with large sporting events and especially with the Olympics and so my biggest uh, takeaway from here is that I would hope that everyone thinks more about these issues and really tries to figure out what's the best way to not only protect their um, protect our athletes and our venues and our, and our various different attendees from the physical issues out there but also the digital issues because I really think that that is something that we need to collectively think about how we can resolve on a, um, on a main national basis and internationally. Um, thank you. Uh, thank the panelists uh, for your very profound uh, insights and 
uh, we, we can develop a, a course on uh, each uh, presentation. Because of the uh, time uh, element, we started a little bit late, but I, I would recommend that we open it up for some Q&A because we do have in the audience, fortunately, uh, people with very rich background uh, in government uh, service, uh, in Congress, uh, in the academic community. So why don't we try to take a couple questions, then the panelists will have a chance to speak again. I know a few of the people had to leave. I think Ellen has a class and uh, so on. Okay, any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Please identify yourself and sure. speak uh, loudly. Do you, do you have a mic over there? or mm -hmm. Can you come? Uh, no. I'll speak loudly. Yeah, so come come up front if you will. Okay. Um, I'm Jeremiah Lillery. I'm with George Mason University. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, two quick questions. One is, uh, um, I, guess, I guess the lady who left uh, talking about integrity. But as you might know, in 9-11, uh, corruption was a key player in uh, the attacks because the gentlemen were able to access the airport using their driver's license, which was purchased by a corrupt official in, in Northern Virginia. So I'd like to know, hear more about the integrity issue and how corruption, because integrity is the opposite, uh, maybe from the legal uh, side. And then the second question I had was, um, I didn't hear, I'd like to hear more about the uh, cyber issue, because as you probably know, there have been lots of threats by different uh, uh, cyber groups, anonymous, et cetera, uh, against the Olympics, against the, the Russians. If you could talk more about that, it'd be great. Any panelists? Uh, Brad, you want to? Uh, yeah. The digital, well, there was a really good report um, several weeks, I believe it was about a week ago, um, with Richard Engel from NBC News, where he showed, um, and I believe it was Peter who actually talked about this, where um, if you access Wi-Fi, your, um, your cell phone or your computer's going to be hacked. Well, I, I think that goes to show you that um, we really have to be thinking more about these issues, meaning that, okay, well, whenever our athletes travel or whenever you travel in business, are you going to take your regular laptop or your regular tablet or your cell phone, or are you going to take one that's totally clean and then you can just utilize it for <coughs> uh, your time being in that, in that other um, venue or that other country? So, I mean, with my client, I usually try to recommend, you know what, where are you going and what is the actual potential threat being um, from hackers or from other potential um, uh, business competitors. And I, I actually say, say to them, you know what, maybe you shouldn't use your regular email address while you're over there. Maybe you should use a messaging app that is encrypted and that uh, you believe um, will not be, um, be as susceptible to being hacked. So it's those types of things that we really need to think about before we travel over to another country or another venue and um, uh, determine whether or not we want to use our digital tools that we have with us. Definitely corruption <coughs> is an issue. And Ari addressed it, and he mentioned how much of this money was stolen, and nobody knows. But it, it seems to me that the security system was organized in such a way that simple corruption for a lone wolf who wants to corrupt a police officer somewhere in order to get to search, he will not allow him to do that because it has so many levels and uh, which he would need to penetrate. But definitely corruption and access to information which was provided by and was received by authorities from uh, all people who came to Sochi is an issue. That's why it says uh, journalists who I cited, and I think you also mentioned the report on your slide, said recently that what is good from this issue that world now knows what Russians are doing and what uh, that not only NSA is uh, looking and watching and uh, tapping the conversations. And um. recently there was a hearing at the European Parliament in January regarding the, the Russian system of, uh, of he was dropping. So there are uh, the questions and, well, <laughs> you understand. Tom, would you, no, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, Mike. Yeah. Tom, one of the uh, themes of all these talks has been international cooperation. And I was wondering, without getting into sensitive issues, if you could do a bit of a flavor of the international cooperation in preparing for the Olympics, for example, 
as I recall, the previous host country was help out the next country. And I think in cases of like the uh, uh, Athens, in Athens, there were some geographic issues involved in transportation because of the uh, hilly nature of some of the sites. And Barcelona, I think there were some trains that would be right, able right. to. Right, uh, right. I think maybe in Barcelona, you were, you were calling the uh, Request for helicopters to move people. Uh, perhaps the uh, U.S. provided some support in that regard. Yeah, I think um, was involved. And yeah, and the point you make about international cooperation is certainly valid. There, uh, there's always teams from the last Olympics that that provide uh, lessons learned within government circles. I know. I remember right after Athens in uh, the summer of 2004. Before the end of 2004, we took a team from various uh, national security agencies to uh, Italy to meet with our Consul General in Milan, who had, was the State Department kind of senior representative for preparations for the Turin Olympics right. in 2006. So we brought to her our initial first impressions on lessons learned from Athens uh, that, that they would apply. This was two years before the uh, Winter Games in Turin. So there's always that effort and that's part per perhaps also of the International Security Events Group, which uh, when I was working in Sydney, uh, we chaired it in the Counterterrorism Office, and then by Athens it was a co-chair arrangement between the Counterterrorism Office and Diplomatic Security. And since the time that I left uh, to go to the FBI, uh, Diplomatic Security chairs that group itself. But they're going to always be the body within the government circles that captures those key lessons learned and shares them uh, again, with within the U.S. government, and then also within our uh, partner, you know, partner nations that we have arrangements with, and uh, and sharing information. So there's that's certainly a healthy process that goes on. And while you may not see um, extensive after-action reports from these uh, events, they're certainly there, and in in some detail, uh, where people are able to, within the government are able to take advantage of them. Uh, I would say that's it, it's it's a, been a very successful process, uh, trying to trying to manage it uh, with the right expectations, but understanding the nature of the threat and the fact that it's very unpredictable, and yet you can't ever underestimate it in any in any country. And so it's very important that we share intelligence information with you know with between our nations, and and there's that effort even between the U.S. and Russia to share the information that we have or threat information with one another so that, that no one's caught uh, unawares. There's nothing more important than preventing terrorism. And if we have issues between agencies, we need to put them aside to uh, make sure that we know about any pending threats that are going on. And that effort always goes on, even when our nations may not seem to cooperate uh, as well as we might like them to. And if something as important as the Olympics, I think we see that cooperation in, increase. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah, I mean, for any of you, why do you, my name is Patrick Murphy, uh, why do you think that Putin, I mean, I think a lot of reasons, but why do you think he put the Winter Olympics in a, sum, in, a, in a summer resort area only a few hundred miles from Dagestan and Chechnya? It looked like he was doing this to the terrorists, and, you know, that must have worried all of you somewhat, uh, the fact that it was so close to terrorist land. Again, remembering the seven-year uh, window before you know the events are planned out or, or the, the venues are determined seven years beforehand. So, but still, certainly based on what Dr. Cohen said, the the threats in that area were were pervasive, and I don't fully understand the decision-making process. That you know, for example, I was kind of rooting for Chicago to get the 2016 Olympics. And they ended up in Brazil. And, and since that time, we've seen things in Brazil that trouble us about soccer and other, uh, other aspects, crime and, th and such. So uh, these are factors that uh, I don't think any one of us can fully understand, but they, they come into play. And there's uh, certainly beyond my uh, experience how those decisions are made. But I, 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 I'm with you on some of those questions. Any other? Yes. So. Wayne? Uh, what kind of role did the legal aid shape uh, in the security preparations for the Olympics? I'm sorry, say that again. What kind of role did the legal aid shape, is the FBI legal aid shape? Well, uh, you know, the FBI has 60-some, approximately 60 FBI offices and embassies around the world. 
uh, anywhere from one agent to a few agents and some support personnel providing uh, liaison between you know the FBI and that host uh, government's uh, service. So in, certainly in a country like Russia, we have a fairly extensive legal attaché office, be, and it's it's across the spectrum of criminal uh, violations. It's not just for, for terrorism reasons. It's also for you know organized crime, drugs, uh, transnational type of threats. So. Uh, if, in fact, an Olympic Games is in a country where that legal attache uh, has an established office, that office gets real busy and probably needs a little bit of enhancement, perhaps like some uh, temporary duty assignments there to help with the influx. But, again, uh, in a case, in most of these games, we're going to send additional FBI resources to that country uh, during the event uh, Again, not to do anything other than uh, work together with the host nation as they've requested. This has been planned and worked out over a long period of time to share information, to provide advice and assistance, and frankly, to worst case situations. And in the event that you know the, the worst scenario that you could think of happens, do we have some of our best experts in country prepared to advise and pro uh, provide assistance to the host nation? And you know. WMD comes to mind, or perhaps a cyber threat or something. We, we want to have our best experts available to the host government. It's their choice what to do about it, but we want to, we want to have work together. And the, the other part is provide training ahead of time. So the legal attache office is going to be working, you know, again, during those seven years of preparation. Uh, they're there, and they're working with their counterparts in law enforcement to uh, determine what training needs may be that they have where uh, we could provide additional training and resources. Certainly in Athens, uh, you know, the threat was very uh, concern. It was a great concern in Athens, frankly, just for a number of reasons. And we provided a lot, somewhere in the t tune of $8 million in, in training alone uh, to the Greeks across law enforcement, intelligence, uh, and even military type of training. So, uh, you know, it's all going to be determined by what's uh, agreed to, but uh, in, in the case of the legal attache office, quite an extensive uh, role that they're going to play. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Well, of course, we cannot cover uh, the different perspectives, and it's not the end of uh, uh, dialogue or a scholarship. It's the beginning, especially uh, <coughs> this is my message to the young uh, young students, <laughs> and uh, I, I think uh, we would have to continue to to see uh, not only the trees but the forest, and uh, we're planning to publish the proceeding of uh, the discussion today and let you know about our future uh, plans, and uh, I want to thank again the the panel. Uh, for your um, insights and, and support and the audience for your participation. Good evening. <laughs>